Okay, let's get, uh, let's get started. Let's pray together. And if you're new here, we just like to put our hands out. And all it is is just say, we want God to just come into this sacred moment, this space, into our lives. And uh, so let's pray. God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the opportunity that we get to be here and to worship and to celebrate you. Thank you for all that you're doing. You're doing some great work and seeing lives forever changed, but also uh, we're, we're stepping in faith and trusting in you and moving forward and seeing lives, uh, future lives forever changed with this uh, uh, Vision 2020. And we're excited to prepare and, and uh, we're just excited about all the pieces kind of coming together over the next two years. And uh, this is gonna be an exciting, exciting adventure for our church. And we're gonna see you show up and, and do great and glorious things. Uh, God, this morning, we're just going to pause, and I know it's a great, beautiful weekend, and we're here at church, and we're grateful for our country, and we know that it's not perfect. We know that uh, totally, but the reality is we love being here, and we're grateful for it, and we pray your blessing upon it, and, and we pray, God, that you would help us this weekend just to celebrate those freedoms and that opportunity to be in this great country. Um, God, we are so grateful uh, for you and your blessings upon our lives. And uh, now, Holy Spirit, we ask that you speak to us, um, and, and he, we want to hear your still, small voice. We love you. We give you uh, glory and honor and praise. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen, amen. amen. Well, this morning, I want to start, I want to go back to our vision. If you take your bulletins out, our, our vision statement is on our, on our um, it's, like, it's like, this is what we believe. This is, what, this is the heartbeat. And uh, this all for me, it's this vision of helping every person experience a journey of new life with Jesus Christ was birthed about 2005 for me. And uh, I was, I was kind of like reading this verse, and there's moments where verses just like totally wrecked me, and that's a good thing, okay? Not wrecking a bad thing, but good thing. It's like totally just disrupts my life. And I read this verse in John 10.10. 10. I want you to look at it with me. And uh, this was really cool. John 10.10, 10, Jesus says this about why he came. He said, I have come that they may have what? What's it say? Yeah, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it to the full. And, and this was one of those verses that just kind of wrecked me. It's kind of like the, whole, the meaning of it is, is, is Jesus is saying, you want to know why I came? You want to you know why I came? This is why I came. You want to know? I mean, this is why I came. I came that you might have life. Now, this life is like this life of fullness here on this side of eternity. But then he goes on to say, and have it to the full. In other words, he's saying not just here in the moment, but here in eternity. It's like, this is why I came. I came for you to experience right now and later life at its best. And, uh, and I started thinking, what exactly does that mean? Like, what does that look like? Life at its best. Is that like on this weekend where we're having a bunch of hot dogs and, and burgers and, 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 and playing croquet? Is that, is that life at its best? Well, it may be good, but it, it may not be at its best. What's life at its best? And during that time, about 05, there was a, a friend of mine that I, I did his funeral, and, and, uh, and, and he was a, a great guy. And, uh, and I, I started thinking, I was like, th when we were in the funeral, it was like they were talking about like... Um, well, it's funny because I always think about jokes when I think about this too. But can I tell you a joke? It's really good. There's, you know, because at the funerals, you like get to tell about the positive, about everything, uh, about, about people and stuff. Well, there was this guy that had his brother. His brother died. And, uh, and, the, and the brother went to the pastor and said, I know you're doing the funeral. And he said, um, listen, I need you to do me a favor. And he said, what's that? And he said, I'm not so sure, but what is that? And he goes, I need you to say during the service that my brother was a saint. And he's like, um, did you not know your brother? <laughs> you know? He's like, well, yeah, yeah, I did, but, but I need you to do that. And he goes, I'll pay you if you would do that. And he goes, well, how much? <laughs> the guy says, well, I told him. And he goes, well, okay, if I do this, um, then I need the money up front. And uh, the guy goes, oh, okay, no problem, no problem. So they come to the funeral, and I don't advise doing this, but anyways, um, they, they came to the funeral, and the guy got up there, and he's talking about this guy's life, and he goes, man, man, if you knew this guy, you would know he was like a cheater, backstabber, like, I mean, he was a deceiver. He's like, all this bad stuff about him, but man, compared to his brother, he was a saint. <laughs> I love it. Well, anyways, I thought I tried. I tried. So don't pay the pastor to say certain things, Okay. But anyways, this guy was awesome, and they always, they said these, like, all these great things, and they said this one thing that, that kind of stirred my heart about this. He said, he lived life to the what? Anybody know? Fullest. And I'm like, what does that mean? What is, what is, what is living life 
to the fullest. And I think what Jesus is trying to get at is it's like living, living life to the fullest is living intentionally in life and experiencing God's best. It's being intentional. It's, it's like focusing on what's important, what really matters. And I started thinking, well, what, what is really important? If Jesus came to give us life, what is it that's really important to him? And I'm kind of a practical guy. I like to keep things simple. And, um, and, and I, I started uh, like on a journey to kind of read through the scriptures and listen to Jesus. And I found that he focused on like four things. Four things. And, um, and, I, and I found that I could, I could work it into that word life. And it's that we use it as the acronym of life. It's learning, involvement, fellowship, and evangelism. I found that he, those four things were incredibly important to him. And, and the, word, the, 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 the word learning, the idea here is, is to learn everything you can about who God is and what God has done and what God wants to do. I mean, if there's anything about the heart of Jesus, you'll find it's like, he's like, I came so that you could see him, so that you could know him. See, at the very heart of God, at the, at the deepest desire, because we were created in God's image and we have desires, God has desires, the deepest desire that God has is for you to know him. Is for you to know him. To be able to say, I know that guy. I know him, not just, I know a little bit about him. I'm not just like, like sprinkling it over my life. It's, it's like, I know him. That's at the deepest desire of, of the Lord. Learning, unfortunately, sounds like hard work, doesn't it? It's like, man, I graduated high school. And it's like, when I graduated high school, I was done learning. It's like, it's hard work. I don't want to do that anymore. But in, but in, in understanding who God is, it's going to require learning. And it goes in this order of L-I-F-E. It starts here with a relationship with God and getting to know the God that made you. I love what Leonardo da Vinci said this. He said, learning is the only thing that the mind never exhausts, never fears, and never regrets. Now, I realize a lot of you, it's like thinking about like learning. It like already gives you a cramp right? It's like, oh, no, please. I, I, I've, I, I'm tapped out. You know, listen, my brain is, is full. I've, I've got enough. Listen, um, when you think about learning about who God is, what God has done, what God wants to do in your life, think about it. You've most likely, and I'm thinking about this myself too, I'm like, I've only like scratched the surface. The well goes incredibly deep. And, and so the, the thing is, he's meant to be explored. You're meant to go and learn. And it's a lifelong journey. And that became the passion of my heart, this vision of, I want to help every person experience the journey, because it's a journey, of this new life. Guys, my hope is that you will, you will spend the rest of your life getting to know the God who made you. I want that for me too. And I'm wrestling with this idea of how does that happen? Well, what do you do? It's hard work, and that's God's deepest desire. You remember that story where a guy came up to Jesus and he said, hey, listen, what's the greatest commandment? And he said, there's two. He said, the first one is, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Second is what? Anybody know? Yeah, love your neighbor as yourself. So there's two things. What he's saying is this. It starts with this. It's this love God and then love people. And it's a summarization of the Ten Commandments. And I want to take you back there just briefly this morning to understand God's heartbeat is to be known by you. And that requires learning. So go back there, Exodus chapter 20. Turn there, would you? Exodus 20. This is when God brings all the people of Israel out of out of, uh, or out of uh, the people of Israel, out of Egypt into the promised land. And, and he speaks these things to Moses. He's like, listen, I want you to command these to the people. And he says, the first four deal with our relationship with the Lord, with God. And he says this in verse three. He says, you shall have no other gods before me. The word before literally is besides. There is no one that compares. There's no close second. It's just me. I mean, they were coming out of a culture of multiple gods, a plurality of gods. But the reality is, I mean, they would have a god for the moon, a god for the sun, a god for the, the fish, a god for the, for the deer. I mean, they had a god for everything. And what he's saying is, listen, it's not true. There is only one, and it's just me. And the idea is it's begging for you to understand this one god wants you to know him. So much so that he gives you a little peek into his heart. Look at verse 4. 
He says, you shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am what? What does he say? I mean, this peek into his heart. I mean, if you really want to get to know me, I'm not just this, this like Santa Claus in the sky with a big white beard and I've just got an axe ready to pounce. You know, it's like, listen, I've, I'm jealous for you. I mean, if we really want to get to know him, it's like I need to kind of put away my, my image of what I think he is and get to know him, who he really is. Because that's at the heart of who he is. He wants to be known. And he's saying, listen, I want you to know me. Verse 6 says, but showing love to thousands of generations of those who love me and keep me, my commands. I mean, God wants to show you that he is a compassionate, merciful, gracious, loving God. He wants you to see it. But listen, he invites you into this experience this to learn more about him. But it's going to require a little bit of effort on your part. You walk towards me. Listen, he is happy to walk towards you. He's open arms. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter when you are, where you are. He invites you to come to him, saying, listen, come, come. I want you to know me. But listen, I'm not going to just throw everything out there. I want you to come. I want you to want to come. And I want you to want to get to know me. Can I just pause right there? That is at the heartbeat of a lot of people. They want to be pursued. They want to be wanted and desired. And God wants to be wanted and desired by you. Do you want him? Run to me. Come to me. That's why he said, Jesus says, come to me, all you weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come to me. I, I've got it. I've got what you need. I invite you to come and take a step of faith. Verse 7, I want you to look at it. He says, and you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. The Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. The whole point there is, listen, everything about a name represents the character of the person of God. And it's like all these names in the Bible kind of represent who he is. It's a peek into his heart and a peek into his character, a peek into him. And he says, don't misuse my name because in misusing my name, it misrepresents me. I don't want you to misrepresent me. I want people to know me for who I am because he has a deep desire to be known. And then he goes on to say, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. Remember this? Seven days is the Sabbath day, shall not do any work. And it uh, goes on the, all the way down to verse 11. And for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. But he rested on what day? On the seventh day. And he says, therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. See, what he's saying is, you're going to have plenty of time to work, plenty of time for distraction. But what, what I've done here is set up a pattern for you to to incorporate me into your life. To incorporate me into your life. Because it can be easy to get distracted. See, all this, and Jesus says, love God, love him. Because God wants, the deepest desire in God is that he wants you to know him. Not just your thoughts about him, he wants you to truly know him. But that, that, that requires learning. That requires something of you and I asking that question of who are you? I mean, that's the whole point, is who are you? Now, there's two ways that we get to learn about who God is. There's a primary and a secondary. Secondary is found in Romans chapter 1, verse 20. So grab your Bibles, turn there. Romans chapter 1, look at verse 20, okay? Romans chapter 1, verse 20. One of my favorite verses but this is what Paul says. He figured something out, and he passes it on to us. He says this. In verse 20, it's up on the screen. He says, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. What about them? What is he saying? They've been what? They have been clearly seen. They have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. Listen, God wants you, you want to get to know God? He, secondary means is just go outside and take a peek at what God has made. I mean, just step back and just say, God, look at the things that you've done. Look at the things that you've made. And we did a series about this, just kind of talking about creation and kind of going back and looking at, at, at the sun and the moon and the stars and, and all the things that he created on the planet, how everything in the system works together. And when you look at these things, I, I've been keeping bees for the last couple of years. 
And, uh, and, and they're, they're, I don't know how many of you keep bees, but it's it, honeybees is what I'm talking about. Like not those wasps and yellow jackets and all this stuff. Sometimes you, they keep you, right, instead of you keeping them because they like to find their ways in those spots where you don't want them. And they're like, oh, no. But the reality is I love honey, and I love honeybees. I love putting on KFC biscuits, too. They're so stinking good. Anyways, so the reality is I love honey. And I love how it all goes. And I started doing this. Honey, and, and there was a friend of mine that was uh, a couple years ago, was an older gentleman. He said, listen, if you want to see God, if you want to see God, he said, learn about the honeybee. So I decided to take him up on it. And I'm looking at these things and how, how, how all of this all works together, this little, this little world inside of a box, and that we get this delicious spit called honey. And I'm like, how in the world, how all this stuff takes place? And it's just an amazing thing. And so now I get to read books and, and listen, reading stuff, learning stuff, it, it can be rather hard, right? Because when you're learning, it's not easy. But it requires work. But when you learn something, you find it absolutely amazing. And there's all these ologies out there, the study of, and I think God wants us to use the brain that God gave us and to stretch it a little. Some of you haven't stretched your brain in a while. It's like, I'm not thinking, I'm not wrestling, I'm not learning some new things. Can't teach an old dog what? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. See, we give that as an excuse, and we cry, cramp, cramp, can't do anything. No, get over it, stretch, let's get going, right? See, what, he, what he's given us is use your brain and read. Now, I realize that the stuff that's that's out, out in the world trying to describe and explain all this stuff, not everything's right. But allow God to, to stretch your mind as you marvel at what is created and see his divine nature and his eternal power. I mean, Paul says this is just secondary. Primary is right here in this book. Primary way to get to know God is in this book. I want you to turn in your Bibles, last, uh, well, not the last place, but, but almost last place, okay? 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul the Apostle is talking to a young pastor and about this, saying, hey, listen, this is one of the most important things that you can do in your life, and, uh, and I really resonate because I'm pretty young and um, pretty amazing looking too, and, uh, but this is, um, yeah, 2 Timothy chapter 3, look at verse 10. This is what he says. He says, you... However, talking, Paul talking to Timothy, you, however, know all about my teaching. And I love this next phrase, my way of what? My way of life. The, when you look, when Paul is saying, listen, my walk with the Lord, my, my wanting to get to know him is not like seasoning, okay? It's not like salt and pepper that I just kind of add it to my life. It is a way of life. And I think some of us have just seen our relationship with God as kind of like a, I'll sprinkle every Sunday, but when it comes to every other day, I've got too much stuff going on. And Paul's saying, no, listen, you're missing out. This is, this is a, a way of life with him. That you, you incorporate him into your day. You incorporate him into your life where you say, listen, I'm going to get to know you. I don't have answers to every, every question that's out there, but I'm going to stretch my mind and, and I want to get to know you. And Paul is saying, listen, this is a way of life, not just a seasoning. He says, listen, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecutions, sufferings, what kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium and Lystra, he goes on to say, he says, the persecutions I endured. He says, yet the Lord rescued me from how many of them? From all of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly what? A godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So while evil men and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But he says, but as for you, Timothy, continue in what you have learned. There it is. And have become convinced of. Because you know those from whom you what? You learned it. So, I mean, this is like a, you get to watch it, not just learn about it, but you get to see it in other people. And Paul is saying, you saw it in my life. I want you to know this isn't like, I'm not just blowing smoke so I can get something from you. I have nothing to gain from you learning more about who God is, what God's done, and what God wants to do in your life. I have nothing to gain. I have everything to rejoice with you about. It's not about me. It's about you. He said, you've seen this in me, and I hope it's in you. I want it to be in you. 
So continue in these things that you have learned. And, and how from infancy that you have known the what? The holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. In other words, what he's saying is you've got this idea that there is a God and he's revealed himself in his word and you read this word, you find out that you need a savior and as a result of a savior trusting in him, you can be rescued by, through faith in Jesus. And then you've been given this book so that you can understand who God is, what God done, and what he wants to do in your life. I mean, that's, in other words, that's what he's trying to get him to see. And then he says this. He says, all scripture, say all scripture. This book, okay, is God breathed. How many of you are breathing right now? Just curious. I mean, he's saying this. These words are like the breath of God. It's like th this is breathing in and out. This is, this is his word. It is that breath that gives you life. When you wake up in the morning, you take that first breath, you're really thankful. Because it says what? I'm alive, right? Okay, some of you are in a little confused. You're alive, all right? There's a pulse. I, I'm breathing. There's breath. And, you know, some of you are breathing right now, and your wife is thinking you had too much coffee or jalapenos from last night. It's like, I, 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 I see, I feel your breath. He's saying, this book, the words that are on the page of this book are like breath. And he tells us what that breath does. In Genesis 2, 7, this word is connected back all the way to the beginning. This Greek and Hebrew, but the concept is there, where it says, the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. And what did he do? And he breathed into his nostrils the breath of what? Life. And the man became a living being. In other words, what he's saying is this book is like CPR to your soul. That his words are, it's the breath. It's his very breath, these words. And his breath gives life to your soul. Do you think his words have, like, importance? So he says, all scripture, this book, these words, let them breathe into your lungs. And it's useful for something. And there's useful for two, four things. Um, it's useful for the first thing is this book, this breath will be useful for teaching. See, this book, this breath will teach you. Who was your favorite teacher? Remember when you were a kid? It's like, who was your favorite teacher? It seems like everybody had like a second grade or a third grade teacher that was like their favorite. And uh, I don't know about you, but I was, I was kind of a rambunctious little kid. And Mrs. Miller in second grade was by far my favorite. But you got to understand, I was not one of those kids that listened, okay? I was like really kind of a, a troubled kid. So I really needed a lot of help. And uh, people, they would get so mad at me. P teachers would get mad at me. They would just kick me out into the hallway and say, forget it. Just get out of my classroom, you know? And Mrs. Miller, guess what she said? Forget it. You're not going anywhere. In fact, you're not going away. You're getting closer. You go sit by me right here at the table and uh, right next to her, her uh, desk. And that woman, she never gave up on me. And even though it wasn't easy, I liked her. When everybody else wanted to give up on me, why is he like this, whatever, she stung. Who's your favorite teacher? Because there were things that that teacher could teach you, like, wow, that's amazing. I'll never forget them. He says, this book will become and could become your favorite teacher will speak to you and help you to understand. But there are times where you don't understand. Hello? Anybody ever read the Bible and sometimes like, I don't get it? It's like the peanuts teacher, wah, 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 wah. And you're like reading it going, I don't get it. And what happens is we get to that point and we close the book and we say, forget it. I can't understand this, so I'm just not going to read it ever again. And it's like, listen, do you understand the laws of thermodynamics? Probably, maybe not, I don't know. But the reality is, do you stop being a person? No, you do. You still go on, and you can maybe try to learn some new things, or maybe try to even learn a little bit more about it. But it doesn't mean that you stop learning because you don't know everything. It's like, just because of that, the enemy would love nothing more than for you to shut the book, say, forget it, I don't want to learn anything more, but God is saying, this is the primary source that gets to know me. I want you to get to know me. So don't close the book. And I know you're not going to understand everything. 
But the reality is, we'll get through and we'll get there together. Okay, I, enough. Second thing is this. All scripture is God-breathed. These words are like breath and it's useful for teaching. Also, it's used for rebuking. This book will confront you because some of you are just not right. Right? I didn't put myself, I said some of you. No, I'm just kidding. Some of us are just not right. I've realized and I've come to this, I've come to, uh, 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 like there's like a law. And I realize that my wife is not wrong about everything. Right? Thank you. You're all looking at me, you all, think, you all came to that same conclusion at some point. You're like, how long did it take? <laughs> you know, but the reality is, uh, your pride is going to get in your way. Some of you, you need, um, you need the breath of God to breathe CPR into your life and say, cut it out. And some of you, your pride is so thick that you will not even listen to it. And he's saying, man... I mean, this book is the very breath of God, and it's going to rebuke you if you let it. It's going to challenge you and say, cut it out. It's wrong. Don't do that. And then there's times where it's going to say, way to go. It's good. Third thing it's useful for is for correcting. It's it's, It's a book that's meant to realign you, like get you back to what is right and true and good. And that takes, it's a process of time. And then the last thing is this. It is useful for training in righteousness. The idea is that this book will prepare you to experience life, what? At its best. See, this is my hope for you, is that you will will experience life, the journey of new life, that you will choose. I want to learn from him. I want to learn who this God is. I want to get to know him better. I want to know who he is, what he's done, and what he wants to do in my life. But it's going to take some effort. It's going to take some work. For some of you, it all starts with this relationship. You've never bowed the knee to Jesus. And it's like, here it starts. That's why the L, it's, you can't jump back and forth. It starts with L, then I, then e, F, then E. It starts with a relationship, and it starts that you get to know the heartbeat of God, that he wants you to know him, that he wants you to know him. And so for some of you, it's just, first of all, it's just saying, I'm going to surrender today. I've been fighting him. I've been running away from him, but I'm going to surrender my life over to him today. Because that's the whole point. When you get to know him, he is a merciful, gracious, loving God who wants a relationship with you and wants you to join him. Second is this. My question for you is, how often is your nose in this book? If you know him, if you surrendered your life to him, their primary way of getting to know this God who loves you, who made you, and these very words are breath coming out of his mouth, performing CPR on your soul. How often do you read it? And my hope is that you will experience new life, new passion to get to know this God who made you. So why don't you stand for closing prayer? Would you join me? Let's pray together. God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the opportunity to be here and just to see you at work. Your word is pretty clear that we need a Savior. And for some of us in this room, we have been fighting and running. Some of us are just visiting family, just here for the holiday, for the weekend. But I pray, Lord, that there's a reason why they're here and the reason why you want them here is because you want them to know that you desperately want a relationship with them. And that if they can come to you, as your word says, to trust in you as Savior and Lord, they can begin that friendship, that relationship with you here today. So, Lord, if there's anyone in this room here today, all they have to do is whisper, Jesus, save me. And you will save. Father, the rest of us in this room maybe have already crossed that line of faith. The question is, are we choosing to be intentional, not be distracted, but choosing to learn more about you. God, there's so many ways, so many resources, but primarily we've got this book. And this book is meant to teach us, to rebuke us, to correct us, and to train us. God, all of this is from your your mouth to our heart. And I pray, God, that you would help us to have renewed passion, renewed uh, desire, 
to get to know you, to learn more and more about you. God, we love you. We give you glory and honor and praise. And today, um, we welcome you into our lives. We welcome you into a new experience, a new journey with you. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. God bless. Well, hey, thanks for joining us and watching this video of our sermon this past Sunday. We hope it's been an encouragement to you. Uh, we believe in the ministry of what, what's happening at Brighton Chapel, and we believe it's going to make a difference in your life. And so we hope that you'll come back and be a part of it. We hope you'll visit us in person, be a part of what's happening here at Brighton Chapel. We hope you have a great day.